Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum dear participants. Welcome to this 23rd session of self-improvement to the Quran series which we began with the advent of Ramadan. The passage that we are going to read out today is from the third surah of the Quran which is Surah Ali Imran and verses 130 to 136 will be under discussion. The text and translation is what I'm going to read out now. Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu la ta'akulur riba adhu'afam mudha'afa وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ وَاتَّقُوا النَّارَ الَّتِي أُعِدَّتْ لِلْكَافِرِينَ وَأَتِيُوا اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ Believers, if in future also you want God's help, do not consume this interest, doubling it many times over, and keep fearing God that you may prosper, and protect yourselves against the fire that has been prepared for the disbelievers. So this is the first part of uh, the passage that we are about to study. And as you can see, it starts off with the verses of riba, uh, spe spe specifically verses which tell us that uh, you should not consume riba, doubling and uh, tripling it and uh, I mean, doing it many times over. So uh, people have generally thought that this verse, uh, th this verse actually refers to compound interest or usually, as they would also say, that interest which is charged at an exorbitant rate. However, this is not a correct interpretation of uh, this verse. The verse actually means that uh, you should not charge interest and that too in such a high amount. So this is a very special style that we also adopt in our own language. It's much like saying, well, don't speak a lie and you're speaking a lie or you're telling a lie even in the month of Ramadan. So it doesn't mean that uh, other than the month of Ramadan, lies are allowed. It only tells us that lying in the month of Ramadan is a, is a, is a grievous sin. So similarly, when it is said that don't charge interest, doubling and tripling it, it doesn't mean that if you don't double and triple it and just you, you just charge simple interest, that would be allowed. No, this is just telling us the heinous nature of, this, of the crime itself or the sin itself. So uh, interest in itself is something which the Quran has said that it's an immoral uh, transaction. So for uh, us, we have been advised and all scriptures advise it as far as uh, loans are concerned, they should be used to help people and not to extract money out of this. So lending basically in our religion and in Abrahamic religions is an instrument of helping out people and not earning money out of it. This is a premise that uh, stands at the basis of all economic transactions which relate to uh, our own economy, uh, specifically in which uh, banks are involved or personal trading is involved. So at all instances in the Quran, you will find that the Quran has made this distinction that consuming interest is something which is absolutely forbidden. And in, a, in an interest-based society in which interest-bearing uh, transactions are still going on, uh, we can clearly see that this is an ele element in which people who are charging interest, they are at fault. But people who are paying interest or uh, they are not at all taken to task anywhere in the Quran, which tells us that as long as interest-bearing transactions are going on in a society, paying interest is something which is not at all proscribed or prohibited. It is charging or consuming interest which is prohibited. However, once interest stands outlawed in a society, then of course, uh, both charging and consuming as well as uh, paying interest would be regarded as outlawed. And... Uh, this uh, has a very a very very deep impact if we uh, analyze the fact that basically it's not interest i mean interest comes later the first thing which islam wants us to do is to use this uh, instrument of lending in uh, as a help for people uh, whether it's uh, personal help whether it's uh, help on the basis of uh, of of some investment that you might be doing however uh, there are areas in which uh, investment can be made and uh, in, it, it, it cannot be uh, called interest at all. If, for example, the uh, instrument of uh, principal secured financing is adopted, which means that if you uh, in invest money and in that invested money, you tell the person with whom you have invested the money that uh, uh, you will receive a certain amount of profit, any amount of profit could be predetermined. But if the business runs in a loss, then of course you would not charge anything. So this is what we can call interest, uh, a principal secured financing, in which you are your principal is secured, but you will only receive a profit if the person with whom you have invested, if he is doing a profitable business. 
nonetheless, as the Quran says, تفلحون, that fear God in this manner uh, so that you may prosper, do not uh, go about uh, charging interest. And this is a immoral and unethical practice. Uh, so one thing which is stated positively now is stated in a negative word, in a negative uh, tone. So positively it was stated, that fear God so that you may succeed. And then it is said that fear the, the fire which has been prepared for the disbelievers. And disbelievers, of course, they, when are, they are used in this sense in the Quran, they refer to people who have intentionally denied the message of the Prophet which has reached them. They, they believe in the Prophet. They have absolutely no two opinions that he is a true Prophet uh, or the truth comes to them in a way that they are absolutely convinced about it. But in spite of being convinced, they end up denying it. So this is what makes them kafir uh, or, or to the extent they are going to be punished, not only in the hereafter, as this verse says, but also in the times of God's messengers, such uh, kuffar, such disbelievers are taken to task in this world as well. And remain obedient to God and his messenger that you earn mercy. Again, this is something which is uh, uh, an exhortation. This is something which Muslims are told, uh, especially if they have any uh, double-mindedness in their in, in their cells, that you have to be devoted to the directive of God and his, his messenger. And uh, if you do so, then remember, you'll earn God's mercy. So obeying God and his messenger is, uh, of course, mentioned here because in the times in which the Quran was revealed, uh, Muhammad Sallallahu was right there in the society and obeying him was uh, like obeying God as some other verses say. So uh, he was actually governing the, the state uh, that was set up in Medina. And uh, before that, obviously, when he was in Mecca, uh, things were different. But this surah, as we know, is a, a Medinan surah. So therefore, when the Prophet had migrated to Medina and the reins of the state were being governed by him, uh, people are told that they must obey him as God's messenger, and now he's the head of the state as well. And then the next verse is a very, very moving appeal, uh, as you can say, uh, see from the words as well. And run to advance to the forgiveness of your Lord and to paradise, which is as vast as the heavens and the earth, prepared for the righteous. So, you see, uh, if you have a slight, I mean, of course, the translation also gives the, uh, the sense, which is found in Arabic uh, to some extent, that the appeal is so moving, it is so, uh, it has such an element of emotion in it. It's like telling people that run towards God's forgiveness. <inaudible> run to advance to the forgiveness of your Lord and to the paradise which has been prepared for the believers and which is as vast as the heavens and the earth. So people are told that you are living in a society in which, of course, uh, there are directives which are revealed to you uh, through uh, the Almighty and, and, of course, in the Quran. And these directives are meant for your own welfare. And as far as your own welfare is concerned, all directives of religion, dear viewers, we have to understand this, as the Quran says, that on numerous occasions, that they aim at our personal purification. So, Taskiya is the Quranic word, which means that you have to be a person who is always on the lookout to purify his soul and his deeds, uh, whether in the collective sense or in the individual sense. So, this cleanse, uh, uh, cleansing of our soul, this uh, purity, this Taskiya is the objective of all directives of religion. And whatever is uh, uh, directed to us, uh, whatever we have been commanded, the essence of that command behind it is that if we undertake and follow uh, those commandments, we follow the directives which are given, then the consequence would be that we would gain that purity in our hearts, purity in our souls, purity in our undertakings. And this is something which the Quran has beautifully depicted here as when you do so, you run towards the forgiveness of the Almighty. And this is an appeal also, it tells us that in spite of obeying the directives of the Almighty, it, it does transpire that at times we fall short, at times uh, we do some mistakes, some blunders. So therefore, this verse tells us that, well, 
if you do those blunders uh, in trying to your best to follow God, then in spite of those blunders, your job is not to get disappointed or just lose hope. Run and leap towards God's mercy. And his mercy is something uh, which is, of course, uh, which entails his forgiveness. And this forgiveness is something uh, which, of course, would be a prelude to paradise. If you are forgiven, God tells us that the of the consequence of forgiveness is paradise. And about paradise, it is said that it would be as vast as the heavens and the earth. I mean, it's like if, if we glance at uh, the heavens above us, uh, if we glance at our own uh, land, our own earth, we find an amazing, uh, unfathomable uh, spread of land and space around us. And this marvels us, this amazes us. So this is just a small comparison which tells us and gives us some idea of the fact that, look, the paradise with which you are being promised is as vast as, as God's, as, as the heavens and the earth that you see around you. And, and these are people, of course, now the muttaqeen are being uh, uh, depicted. So they are those uh, who, whether in ease or in hardship, even if they encounter any excesses from those upon whom they spend, they curb their anger and forgive people. So they, sp they spend in all circumstances, they, they spend uh, whether in ease or whether in uh, hardship, and they curb their anger and forgive people. These are the people who are thorough in their deeds. So it says, uh, so this is one of the hallmarks of believers that it's not that they spend whenever they have money to spare. Um, I mean, this is a, such a beautiful concept. It, it, the, the hallmark of a believer is that whether he is in scarcity, whether he is in, uh, in, in any hardship, that doesn't, that doesn't figure in his uh, habit of spending. So, Allazina yunfiquna fi sarra'i wa zarra'i that whether they have the comfort, whether they have spare uh, spare money or spare wealth, of course, that is fine. If, and if they are in any discomfort, even then. So in all these circumstances, they run and they find opportunities to spend in the way of God. And when such a circumstance arises and people ask them, they don't scold them. As a result, well, they control their anger. And also, they are those who forgive people. Wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen. And then a, a very, very important uh, uh, aspect is, uh, is is actually delineated near the en uh, end of this passage. It says, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِزُنُوبِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَخْفِرُوا الزُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَلَمْ يُسِرُوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ So one of their aspects is that they are people such that if they commit a lewd act, some vulgarity, they accidentally end up doing some vulgarity or something which is evil to themselves, they remember God immediately, and seek forgiveness for their sins. And who but God can forgive sins and do not deliberately, deliberately persist in what they have done. So, so if, if they step in some vulgarity, if they do something which, which is like wronging their own souls, they don't persist in this sin for long. They realize as soon as they come out of this, uh, this uh, frenzy and they seek God's forgiveness and then they are not, not audacious on their sins. They don't insist on their sin. And we, as a result, they, when, when they don't do so and they know very well that this is something which they should not do. So, and do not deliberately persist on what they have done. And then it says that as far as uh, these believers are concerned, It is these who shall be rewarded with forgiveness from their Lord and with orchards beneath which streams flow. They shall dwell there forever. And what a grand reward this is for those who do righteous deeds. So the result, of course, is then depicted in these uh, very powerful and potent words that they, for them, the reward of their deeds is that they'll be forgiven 
and then they will be made to dwell in paradise beneath which streams flow and they'll remain in that paradise forever. And this is for those who do righteous deeds. So you see, the Quran always inspires us. It always motivates us that, yes, uh, if you spend, if you uh, adhere to the principles that have been delineated, there they might be problems, there might be hardships, but ultimately you will be rewarded with God's forgiveness and with the paradise that we just spoke of, which is as vast as the heavens and the earth. And another thing which is said here is that you'll be living here forever and forever. It is eternal bliss for you. And name Ajrul Amilin. And this is a reward of for those who are the righteous. So this brings us to an end to this discussion on this passage. And we are now open for any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Shazad, for this amazing lecture on a very relevant realm of affairs. Uh, I have a written question to kickstart the process of questioning. They are asking about uh, performing salah while they are traveling either by car or by any public transport, and neither wudu can be performed nor the yamun. So how can purity be achieved so that prayers could be offered? In another similar situation, when one finds themselves as the vessel being fired on them, but they couldn't perform. So what should be done for the prayers in both these cases? So in both cases, I mean, tayammum suffices. And I don't find any reason that you would not be able to do tayammum if you are traveling. I mean, if you're traveling by road, if you're traveling in a car, if you're traveling in a, in a train or any other means of transport, you can do tayammum uh, from the sides of the car, from the uh, panel that you have in front of you. So it's not that you need always need a, a place like clay or mud before you. So the Quran tells us it has to be a clean surface. And that surface could be something which, that, which you have in your car as well. So the Yamum is something which suffices both for whistle and for wuzu in case uh, both are needed. Either of them is needed. And uh, so they can they can do so while traveling. And uh, while traveling, we have been told in the Quran that farijalan or rukbana, whether you are traveling by foot, even by by foot, and whether you are traveling on a transport or on a conveyance, you can offer this Allah. Right, I believe it may have helped. Baran Nashur, you may ask your question now. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sir, I have two questions. One regarding the riba aspect, because if we, does that mean that taking a mortgage is allowed? Yes, it does. You can mortgage your house, you can buy a car uh, as a result of that, because in that case, you are not at all uh, paying, I mean, you're not charging interest, you're paying interest. And the other thing that you might also uh, like to know here is that uh, in, in, in assets, the question of interest does not arise in even the first place. You see, basically, you are buying an asset, which is either a car or a house or maybe some other thing. And uh, interest is only on consumable items, like, for example, if you had you were borrowing money. So in this particular case, uh, even the issue of interest does not arrive. I mean, it doesn't even arise. Interest arises on, on transactions which are done on currency. So even if you had borrowed some money, then you were paying it back. That was absolutely fine because you would be paying interest. Because in this, however, in this case, you're not even borrowing money. All that you're doing is that the bank or the organization has bought that, uh, that thing for you, whatever that thing is, a house or a car, and now you're paying back. And whatever extra you're paying back is basically a rent on the thing that you are yet to become an owner of. So precisely for this reason, there are many countries or at least a few countries who call this settlement or this uh, nature of agreement as a hire and purchase agreement. So it's in essence, basically that you are if you bought something and the installment that you are paying over and above is basically the rent of using that thing. So uh, in the case of uh, mortgages, as I said, the question of interest doesn't even arise in the first place. It would, it would have arisen if you were uh, borrowing currency. But in that case, as I said, again, you would be paying interest, which is not uh, at all uh, forbidden. So in both these cases, whether you have, you have borrowed currency, you have borrowed money and you're paying back that money, or you've bought an asset and then you're paying over and above that asset in installments in both these cases. I mean, in the first case in which you've bought this, uh, this asset, interest does not even arise. I mean, interest always arises in, in currency transactions. And in the case of a currency transaction, if you do borrow currency, then of course, 
it would arise, but in that case, you would not be charging interest, you'd be paying interest, which is in itself something which is not forbidden. Okay, but does that mean that uh, as well, like if you are, for example, a student loan that you have to pay in like uh, 35 years off, but you die in the process of paying the mm -hmm. debt off, would that be considered that, uh, that, would that be a sin on you because you did not pay off your debt before you passed away? You see, uh, what happens is that in, in all such agreements, there is uh, this provision which is made. And if you write, a, if you see, see these standard uh, agreements which are made between uh, the organization and the student who takes the loan, they have all these provisions already set out. And they know that if the, uh, if the boy or the person who has taken the loan passes away or is inflicted with some accident or if he's, it's difficult for him to return the money, uh, even in 20 or 25 years. So these are stipulations that they already mentioned. So I think you should look up the agreement which they make because they, they take into consideration all these uh, exceptional circumstances and they give you more concession in that. And the other thing is that at times uh, if a student is uh, not able to pay it back, then he writes this that, this that either, I mean, he gives this undertaking that if I pass away or something happens to me, then the, written, the loan should be written off. Or he says that, well, I have such and such savings with me uh, or such and such thing which I own. So if I pass away, so my, you can take the amount as much as is available from my leftover inheritance, I mean, which, I, uh, which I leave behind. So these are the, some of the possibilities. But in general, uh, all these agreements, they take into consideration such circumstances and you, you can just look them up. Okay. Uh, Naveed Irfan, you may go ahead. I had a question from Riba, that I do a business and sometimes people have to give up their money. And there is a limit that you will return the money in three months. But sometimes it will be 4, 5, 6 months. So in this case, we call them penalty, that you will get a penalty. So sometimes they give it to them fast, but sometimes they are late. So in this case, if we charge a penalty, then what will it come to the interest of interest? Not at all. Penalty is absolutely justified. This is a transaction that you made with them and it was a commitment on their part. So if they do not honor their commitment, you can penalize them. This is perfectly okay and this will not be regarded as interest. You see, it all depends the nature of the agreement. If that agreement is that you, you lent some money to a person and it was on easy installments, then uh, obviously the person was liable to pay for it. But uh, there has to be some provision in, in, when you lend some money that what if a person is not able to do. So I think it depends on the agreement that you have made at the time of giving that loan. If the agreement says that the loan will be written off or it will not be uh, charged if a person becomes incapacitated or passes away or something happens, then of course it will be written off. But I mean, it all depends on the nature of the agreement that you make when you give that loan. And this is very important that you do make it, uh, make an agreement with the person and also have it written down so that both parties are clear uh, that what the conditions of this loan are. Thank you. Nadia, you may go ahead and ask your question. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Shahzad. Wa alaikum salam. मेरा सवाल भी रिबा के मुतालिक है हम रिबा अल नसिया और रिबा अल फदल को कैसे डिफरेंशिएट कर सकते हैं और क्या ये भी इंक्रीज हो जी प्लीज रिबा नसिया रिबा इन नसिया मींस रिबा ऑन लोन एंड रिबा अल फजल मींस रिबा ऑन ऑन इन विच इज विच इज नॉट आई मीन चार्ज ऑन लोन बट इज चार्ज ऑन on the spot transactions. And this is basically a misnomer which has arisen because of not understanding certain uh, narratives. Riba always is Nasiya. It always is on transactions of loan. It does not uh, figure in spot on, on the spot transactions. So it's like a misunderstanding which uh, our FIC actually has uh, introduced and there is no such thing as Ribal Fuzzle. Uh, Riba is always Riba Nasiya. And if you would like to have more details, I would uh, refer you to my teacher Javed Amagamadi's research on this topic which he has presented in his book Mizan and has shown convincingly that Rebel Fuzzle has arisen uh, because of not understanding the some prophetic narratives whereas uh, Riba is just of one type and that is uh, Nisya. Nisya means loan so it's always uh, I mean on loan it's never on, uh, on transactions which are carried on the spot like for example uh, at the same time which uh, which does not involve a loan. 
बहुत शुक्रिया um, इसी से रिलेटेड ये इस्लामिक बैंकिंग का तस्वर है um, हमारे पाकिस्तान में खास तौर पे एक रवैया आ गया है कि um, जो नॉर्मल बैंकिंग ट्रांजैक्शन है उसमें चूंक के इंटरेस्ट इन्वॉल्व होता है तो um, जो बहुत ज्यादा ऐसे जरा रिजिड लोग होते हैं वो उसका बाइकआउट करते हैं और खास तौर पर ऐसे होता है कि जो लोग uh, बैंक में जॉब कर रहे होते हैं ऐसे तो उनका भी एक तरह से बाइकआउट शुरू कर देते हैं कि इनके घर खाना नहीं है पीना नहीं है या इस तरह से तो ये इस इसको कैसे ट्रीट किया जा सकता है उनको कैसे समझाया जा सकता है कि मतलब इससे मुताल मुझे प्लीज एजुकेट कीजिए आई थिंक इट ऑल डिपेंड्स ऑफेज पे कैन चूज योर ऑडियंस विद विच यूड लाइक टू इंडल्ज एन एंगेज इन डिबेट विद because there are, these are things which often we muslims have emotional attachment to and the voice of reason seldom uh, comes across us so i would suggest that if you are engaged with people who would like to listen on the basis of reason and and rationality and arguments of course then you can put forth and you can commence your discussion with them but there are so many people who would not i mean who would not budge who would not entertain any alternative opinion so for for such people i would always uh, advise that just just ignore such people why would you like to convince people uh, who are c- already convinced of something so only people who are open to discussion who are open to new questions in life they are the ones with which you can engage in discussion so this is a is a general principle and uh, as far as an attitude is concerned for example of not going to people who are doing bank jobs or not uh giving your daughter in hand to to such people i think this is again uh an extreme because uh, we have to understand that uh, today banks have evolved into much uh, i mean to a, to a, to a significantly different uh internal structure than they were when they were formed two or three centuries ago now most banking uh transactions although they still call them interest they have in fact deviated from their original position and now they have become have become more of financing uh, loans uh, and, and financing projects and uh, except for personal loans which don't figure uh, there are very few areas in which interest has remains in its original form and i think uh, it's just a change or question of changing the terminology in a lot of respects we just talk about mortgage a, on a very similar basis i think credit cards which is a big service which uh, banks give us uh, the only change that they would like to make i think or they should make is that they should change the lending i mean the change that that the amount that they charge when a person is not able to uh, give the amount which is lent in at the right time and this they call this as uh, interest however you should change the terminology and as uh, someone asked us before me that even you lend someone some amount and he is or she is not able to return it then you can penalize that amount i mean that person so credit card themselves uh, which are which is, which is they provide a great service to all of us and people who don't return it in within time interest in char- is charged for them so instead of charging interest what uh, banks can do they, they should change the name of interest and charge a penalty on them which could be different uh, for different amounts that you loan to that you lend and uh, so i think that if you look at modern banking the institution has evolved much more and it is no longer that institution which was created out of interest uh, a lot of things have uh, developed and uh, it's now more of financing so i think it would be unwise to call people who are doing bank jobs as if they are doing something which is haram or prohibited and but i said all these things can only be discussed with people who are willing to undertake a discussion on something new which has happened Uh, other than these such people i would suggest that i mean it's always best to discuss topics which are other than religion with such people thank you varan nashur you may ask your question now sir my uh, my second question was about the story of jesus in the quran because well the Bi- the story of uh, jesus in the bible is that he was uh, put on the cross died and re- resurrected 3 uh, days later mm-hmm. and the quran uh denies the story that he that there was something someone else to resemble him but i listened to another lecture of you where you told that jesus did pass away so um also i want to talk about uh, the quranic story with uh, christian friends but i don't know exactly what mm. the truth is now you see uh christianity and islam differ a lot regarding the the death of jesus regarding the passing away of jesus 
uh, to all Christians, whether they are Catholics or they are Protestants, that for them, he died on the cross and uh, it was this sacrifice that he gave, that if you just believe in this sacrifice that he gave, that uh, your sins would be forgiven as long as you believe in the fact that Jesus died for your, uh, for your, for your salvation. However, the Quran has categorically denied his crucifixion. And the Quran states that uh, neither did they kill him nor did they crucify him. But the matter was made muddled up for them. They just they, they, they could not get to know what exactly happened. And this perhaps was like a punishment for them. And the Quran at another occasion has said that he will be given or he was given actually natural death. And only the thing is that his body was never found. Uh, perhaps the Almighty had just uh, taken it away from, uh, through his angels and maybe they had buried him somewhere which, where people could not even know where he was buried because the, there was a very strong chance that Jews would uh, mutilate the, his body or uh, uh, harm it in any way. So in order to have, it, uh, have that sanctity restored, uh, this was never allowed to happen. So the Quran says uh, that, as I said, that he, he was given a natural death. But uh, on another note, I would also like to tell you that, I mean, you see, discussing religion with another religious denomination is, is best when you start off with common grounds. Uh, uh, crucifixion is something which is perhaps the biggest difference between Christianity and Islam. And uh, uh, if you start off with these, uh, yes, it's perfectly okay to, dis to say that what the Quran stance is, just to educate them or maybe give them the surahs of the Quran which uh, depict the life of Jesus. Uh, but if you would like to have a discussion with such people, uh, I mean, you need to be very careful whether this should be the first or starting point of your discussion. I think uh, the start starting point should be monotheism because the, both religions, they are, they believe in one God. And uh, although, yes, Christianity has its own version of one God, they have this Trinity, which is not found anywhere in the Bible, but was basically a Pauline construct, uh, St. Paul of Tarsus, uh, we know. Uh, was the one who was most responsible for this. Uh, originally, there was nothing that we can find in the Bible. So I think, uh, I mean, this is a, a simple thing that you can tell them. You can just look up or just Google uh, uh, the fact that how Jesus' life was and it's mentioned in the Quran. You'll get the relevant Quranic verses from Google as well. But more important is that what topic should you engage in with your Christian friends uh, and what should be perhaps left uh, to a later uh, time? Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. So I did not really engage because I was not very sure what to say, actually. That's why I asked this question. But does that mean I think, that uh, one of the one of the things that you might do is that instead of engaging in any discussion, just give them the Quran as a gift. Uh, just give them maybe selections from the Quran or maybe an introduction to the Quran. You'll find some of the books that we have authored, uh, which uh, like a, they are like a primer to the Quran, which make you uh, introduce you to the Quran before you read the whole book. They, they make you have a small idea of what topics and what the Quran deals uh, with. So uh, one of the things that is more recommended is that instead of we speaking to them, the best is let God speak to them uh, by letting his scripture being read by them. No, exactly. Yeah, that's what, that's what I'm, was, I'm, I'm trying to do. I'm trying to... Uh make them read about uh, Islam and uh, and more. Right. But I was uh, like, just to clarify for myself, does that mean that that uh, Jesus was never put on the cross and uh, yes. never died on the cross? But he, he never died on the cross. Yes, this is what the Quran says. So, but uh, did he, he was died? given a natural death. He was yes. given a natural death. It was like a Quran says, in Nimutavafika, which means that I will give you death and then he uh, t and take you away from them and then uh, cleanse you uh, from these disbelievers and and people who follow you uh, after you pass away will always remain dominant on those who do not follow you so this is uh, stated in the 55th verse of the third surah uh, very clearly and it tells us how Jesus his whole life would be uh, has been depicted in the Quran Thank you. Mashab Babasim, you may ask your question now. Uh, alaikum. My question is regarding last uh, lecture. Which imanat Allah gave to us that we have to guard? I think we, I explained this in detail. This, this amana refers to the freedom of choice that we were given. The freedom to exercise our own will. 
this this free will that we were given because the, as the verses go on they say that it would be a consequence of this free will that you are given that some of you would end up as believers and others would end up as hypocrites and disbelievers and as a result would be either rewarded or punished so uh, the trust that we were given was this uh, this gift of expressing our will uh, doing what we like using our uh, our own discretion so sir like uh, if it's our will then uh, how much that takdeer you know uh, affect that our will so as a believer well, I've, we believe i try to i have tried to explain that the word takdeer has never been used in the quran in the sense that we use it as if something has been written down you will find the whole of the quran uh, with devoid of any such mention the, what the quran does tell us us is that uh, the god is informed of whatever will happen so it's god's foreknowledge that is always mentioned in the quran so that's the god that god's foreknowledge is something which only tells us that whatever we do is already known to him however whatever we do will be through our own free will it's not that god is forcing us to do what is what we are going to do so god's knowledge is independent of our actions he knows the outcome he knows what will happen but what will, whatever will happen will happen not because god is going to will it but because we are going to choose it mm-hmm. so sir for example if somebody uh, getting lost in their business somebody gets sick somebody child die in accident so how then um, you relate these things with that word takdeer and I mean, will this is i mean this is uh, this is not i mean this is some these are incidents which are going to happen for everyone i mean kullu nafsin zaiqatul maut quran says that every person is going to die uh, the quran says that uh, things follow their natural form if you don't work hard the results will not come you see if you not uh, if you don't look after your health you'll get sick so there are there are certain physical laws that this this universe is also going to follow and of course there are some other laws as well in which you pray to the almighty to help you and then his help also comes and it increases what you what the input that you gave so i mean you have to understand that whatever we do uh, it's going to have repercussion it's going to have its consequences if we do something in the right direction chances are that things will go in the right direction but of course uh, then the chances are also that at times the things which are done in the right direction they don't end up with the same favorable results as we would have expected so uh, in most cases however if you as i gave you this example that if a if a farmer sows the seeds in his uh, in his land and cultivates them and generally if he gets favorable weather conditions then the crop comes in a, in a good way but what if he does not look after the crop very in, in the right way does not uh, not does not uh, give it enough manure or enough sunlight or whatever the needs of that crop is then how could he expect uh, the result to be in his in his favor so you see there are certain things which we are required to do and once we do that those things then of course circumstances are also uh, at times favorable or not but then we know that these things uh, at times god will let them happen the way we would have planned them to happen or at times he does not let them happen because of some some calamity or some t- trial or test that he would like us to go through so uh, basically what we have to realize is that we are to do what best we think we should do through our own intellect and through our belief system and let uh, the results uh, spring forth in uh, as a as a favor as a, as something which was not going to do हम्म ओके सर ये जो आपने क्रॉप का ये तो सूरत काफ में भी एक वाक्य है ना जब उन्होंने इंशाल्लाह नहीं कहा तो वो उनकी सारी फसल तबाह हो गई तो सर वो तो फिर अल्लाह की मर्जी भी हुई ना मतलब इंसान के पास टोटली सो यू सी दैट्स इज अ दैट वाज अ इंसिडेंट टू एक्सप्लेन सम सर्टेन थिंग्स वला यस्तस्नून सूरत दैट इज इन सूरत कलम बेसिकली एंड so i think that has a that was a very specific example and uh, if you are referring to the same incident which i am referring to in surah qalam it's not that it was a specific orchard that was being referred to it is basically a parable it is a parable an example that was given it was not a real orchard and oh. uh, the example was given there and uh, so therefore uh, that example once it was given it, uh, the leadership of the quraish were compared to the owners of that or- of that orchard how arrogant they have become uh, just as the owners of that orchard they thought that they'll just وَغَدَوْا إِلَى حَرْدٍ قَادِرِينَ they'll just go and harvest that crop and then suddenly uh, a storm came and it ravished the whole crop and they they were just left dumbfounded so i think uh, you have to take things uh, in the way they come and uh, at times it does happen that things don't go in the favor uh, i mean in in the same sequence as you would like have liked them to do i mean to have happened 
But this is not always the case. Generally, what happens is that uh, if you have sown your land in the proper way, generally the crop will come unless mm -hmm. God makes his interference due to some reason. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Fabia Niazi, you may go ahead. बारान रशूर ने जो जिक्र किया है मेरा उसी से मुतलक सवाल है आ, हम जब डिस्कशन सर्कल्स अरेंज करते हैं आ, अपनी सराउंडिंग में तो हम मुख्तलिफ टॉपिक्स जो हम सीख रहे हैं उनको शेयर करते हैं जैसे मकसद हयात हो गया कुरान और सोनन इलाही और इनकलाब और तदरीज ये, ये इन मौजूद पर गुफ्तु आसान हो जाती है समझना भी आसान है आ, लेकिन जब आ, जैसे हजरत ईसा का मामला है इस पर उस्ताद जी ने कुल सात हिस्सों में आ, समझाया है और उसमें आ, मैंने देखा कि उलूमल हदीस और कुरान ग्रामर ये दो मजामीन जिन जिन्होंने पढ़े पढ़े हुए हैं उसको ज्यादा बेहतर अंदाज से समझ पाते हैं क्योंकि इसमें कुछ ऐसी असलाहत उस्ताद ने इस्तेमाल की उसूल का इतलाक करके दिखाया और वो समझने के लायक था अगर मैंने ये स्टडीज ना ये स्टडी ना किए होते तो मुझे कभी भी नहीं समझ आती अब ये इस तरह के मौजू या जैसे इसरा वल मिराज हो गया इस तरह का मौजू जब हम लोगों के सामने रखेंगे तो लोग तो ये मजा में नहीं पढ़े हुए हम अपनी फैमिली सर्कल में फ्रेंड सर्कल में ऐसे मौजूद कैसे रख सकते हैं इसमें तो ये दोनों टूल्स यूज होते हैं I mean, as I said, you see, it depends on the level of understanding because uh, I mean, it's not always linguistics that is needed. At times, simple translation, uh, if it is, uh, I mean, understood correctly, it does its its job. But as I said earlier on, that it all also depends on whom you are discussing and the topic which is being discussed. Not every topic is uh, is advisable to be discussed with family members because you see, most of our, of our family members they are geared towards. Beliefs which they have been taught by their mothers, I mean, their grandmothers, and their parents, and the society, and in general, they adhere to these uh, beliefs through their emotions. They are not tuned to look at these things through reasoning. So, as I said, I mean, first of all, you should pick and choose that which is the person that you, who is open-minded enough, who would like to in the, engage in a discussion, who is worthy of being discussion of this discussion. So, choose those people, and it's not always essential that you are aware with uh, in in depth with Arabic. Unless, of course, the question which is on, uh, asked is needs that depth. Otherwise, as I said, just look up a simple translation. When the Quran says, if you give, I give you an example uh, regarding Jesus, the Quran says, "Inni mutawafika," I'll give you death. I mean, there is no other translation. People who have differed with this translation had to go to great lengths in changing uh, or, 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 or actually uh, elaborating in a different way because to them. The hadith literature holds more priority in understanding because our hadith say that the uh, Prophet Jesus is said to return. So therefore, they had to reinterpret the word mutawafika, and uh, and it and they interpreted it to mean as if God is going to take it, take him to himself, in 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 in, in, in his living form. But if you look up a uh, dictionary in Arabic, you'll find whenever the word tawaffa is used with uh, an object which is a mafool, which is a human being, it it can only mean one thing and that is to give that person death so whenever you find the mafool to be a rajul or a, or a person who is who is living then tawaffa whenever it is used with this mafool it has just one meaning and that is to give death to that person i mean this is a slightly technical but other than that as i said unless uh, you just look through these uh, details you'll find that uh, a simple translation would would give you the answer but what has happened is that because at times we don't stick to that translation and on most cases hadith literature modifies our understanding of the quranic words that we are led to change or maybe modify the meaning of what the quran actually means because we need to adjust the narratives so when the narratives say that jesus is was alive or he was was taken and he's going to return uh, so i mean people think that there is such a certain thing which bukhari or muslim have mentioned then maybe you are not understanding the quran correctly because how could bukhari and muslim would uh, make this error that jesus is going to return and if he, if he is to return then he has to be alive so you see there is a whole chain of arguments that you need to understand thank you so uh, so much dr shahzad uh, navid irfan you may ask a question now and this will be the last question of the day assalam alaikum wa alaikum assalam डॉक्टर साहब अभी जो आपने बुक्स मेंशन करी हैं क्या वो चैट पे मिल जाएंगी मुझे वो नाम 
जो कुरान के ऊपर आपने बताई थी जी अभी आप जो उन्होंने जो सवाल किया था जिसमें कुछ किताबें कुरान के ऊपर हैं जो गर मुस्लिमों को दे सकते हैं या नॉन मुस्लिम्स को सो आई वाज एक्चुअली रिफरिंग टू एनी सिंपल ट्रांसलेशन दैट यू माइट हैव विदाउट एन अरेबिक टेक्स्ट देयर आर मेनी ट्रांसलेशंस व्हिच आर पब्लिश विदाउट एन अरेबिक टेक्स्ट लाइक फॉर एग्जांपल एन जे दाऊद ट्रांसलेशन और मौलाना वहीदुद्दीन खान ट्रांसलेशन you'll find it without any arabic text which is advisable to give because uh, i mean they're not going to read arabic it's just the simple english translation and the other thing that i uh, advise is that there are two books that we have published one of them is called selections from the quran uh, which is like a small book which is uh, an overview of the quran in which some of the verses of the quran are uh, selected and given so that people before they enter the whole quran they just have a glimpse of the quran and the second book is understanding the quran for beginners so people who are non muslims or maybe people who are studying the quran for the first time uh, they will find the introduction to the quran to be helpful before they start reading the book ji mo asal mein maine hamare ek dost ko di thi quran diya tha abhi to usne dekh kar bola bahut bada hai ye main kaise matlab to usne wahi wo so show kiya tha so that is why that is why this book selections from the quran is meant is is a very small book it is meant to give people an overview of the quran is it available in hindi matlab okay. it's not available in hindi unfortunately it's available uh, in english okay al morid hind may be publishing this ha huh, you may be, you may ask them ji uh, thank you dr shahzad for the talk today we'll see each other tomorrow inshallah okay.